there is still time to change the road you are on. That may be the most important line in rock and roll history. It's in one of the most famous rock and roll songs. It might not immediately come to mind, but it's about a woman who is leading a misguided life. And the song's saying there's only two roads in life, the right road and the wrong road. Now, there's lots of ways to be on a right road. There's lots of ways to be on the wrong road, but only two roads. And it's saying you're on the wrong one, so there's still time to change the road you are on. That rock and roll song is based on Genesis 28, but you actually wouldn't know that unless you translate a certain arcane Hebrew word a certain way. Let me explain. Jacob, in Genesis 28, is running away from Esau. Remember, he had deceived his father Isaac and stolen the family standing from his older brother Esau. So he's running away. If Esau catches him, Esau's going to kill him, and they would eerily recapitulate the Cain and Abel story. So Jacob's running away. He comes to a place. He's tired. He pulls out a stone to use as a pillow. How tired do you have to be to use a rock? He's bone tired. He goes to sleep. And then he has a dream. This becomes the most famous dream of all time. He dreams of a ladder going up to heaven, and he sees angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. When he wakes up, he realizes this must be a special holy place, and he calls it Bethel, which means the house of God. And for all time, churches that have named themselves Bethel, every single church hopes that it too is a holy place that helps connect you with higher things. I hope every church, all 300 churches in Lincoln, churches everywhere are a true Bethel that helps people ascend to the higher things in life. Bethel. Now, the symbolic meaning of this dream The historic church often took it to mean the journey of every individual soul. You're either going up or you're going down. I don't mean heaven and hell. Your your soul is either aspiring to its most noble traits, striving for the best things, the most wholesome things, or you're descending into your baser nature. I, I don't mean heaven and hell. I mean how you're living life. Now, based on this one word, in Hebrew it's salam, Sulam can be translated ladder. It can. However, it's the only place in the entire Bible that Hebrew word is used. So scholars aren't sure exactly how to translate it. They don't have anything to compare it to. So it also seems to mean a staircase of some sort. Steps. Are you taking steps up or down? Some Bibles translate it a stairway. It's a stairway to heaven. And now you know the famous rock song that is based on Genesis 28. And this rock song has an intensity. It's about whether you are on the right type of journey. What kind of road are you on? And it's about a woman that's chosen the wrong one. Are you going up or down? I don't mean heaven and hell. Are you seeking your best or not? Rock and roll is all this striving and yearning and intensity. Now, in 1972, Robert Plant felt like the words were channeled to him. Jimmy Page was setting down the guitar licks. 1972, they wanted to create a rock and roll epic over eight minutes. Eight minutes. It starts with acoustic. And it starts in A minor to, to, to begin with a poignancy. Oh, oh, bring it up. Bring the song up. this song over eight minutes will begin to build. Oh, they're using Renaissance recorders. 
It's 1972. The Beatles have made everyone try to use cool instruments now. Bring it up. Everything was changing from acoustic to electric. They wanted to show how to do it. It's about a woman who thinks all that glitters is gold. She's trying to buy her way into heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. Bring it up. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold and she's buying the stairway to heaven. When she gets there she knows if the stores are all closed. Well, for decades, Teenagers have poured over these lyrics. What exactly do they mean? Robert Plant said he changed his mind all the time what it meant, but that it was about a woman that was on the wrong road. Words can have different meanings, and the journey is long. Ooh, it makes me wonder. Ooh, it makes me wonder. Rock and roll is this intense striving and yearning. And it's best, so is religion. Striving to go higher, not lower. I don't mean heaven and hell. I mean, are you developing your most noble traits? It's this striving and this intensity, and it builds over eight minutes. The song begins to speed up. Robert Plant starts singing faster and faster, and Jimmy Page uses that two-neck guitar. Oh, start bringing it up, and it goes all electric. Bring it in loud. Bring it in loud. Oh, he's screaming now. Keep it up. I should have stolen and I sold. There was a lady we all know. <laughs> you should have done this. Or so, like that. You should have done that. Oh, yeah. Church really is like rock and roll. It's a striving. It's a yearning. This intensity we feel, are we working our way up or down? I don't mean heaven and hell. I mean, are you, what matters more than whether you're developing your most noble traits? What matters more? I'm beginning a sermon series today on why religion matters. And I began with Jacob and Robert Plant because in some most basic way, religion is about striving together to go higher, right? To get better, together, in some basic way. It'll be a three-part sermon series on why religion matters, but I'm aware that you don't really have to make a case for it. It's very clear that religion matters. 2.4 billion people in the world are Christian. 1.8 billion people are Muslim. 1.1 billion people are Hindu. The world knows religion matters. Do you know that in America, religion is the largest way people gather in groups compared to anything? Some 60 million people on a weekend will gather in church. Compare this to these other big groupings you imagine. Church is way bigger. People know somehow that they should strive for higher things together. 60 million? So take college football. Seems pretty popular. College football over a whole season with 669 programs over a whole season playing hundreds upon hundreds of games pulls in a total of 47 million people in America over the whole year. Church one weekend beats that by a mile. Some 60 million? Imagine all the schools that dot our land. If you added up all the students in America, elementary, junior high, and high school, that's 55 million people. Church every weekend gathers more. People know. We should strive for the best of things. We packed 90,000 people in Memorial Stadium. We call it the third largest city in Nebraska on that day. Every weekend in the over 300 churches in Lincoln, it packs in that much more. I don't really need to preach a sermon series on why religion matters, but... If you listen, you can start to hear that people are wondering 
Is religion old hat? Is it a bunch of ridiculous beliefs? Is it something kind of silly? Well, they forget the intensity of striving together for the best things, but they think it's a bunch of theology you either agree with or don't or think is absurd or not. So I begin a series, Why Religion Matters. You know, when I was 23, the exact same age that Robert Plant was writing that song, I wasn't sure religion mattered. I was a college kid. I was, start, I was graduating. I, typical college kid, I hadn't been to church in like two or three years, right? And, and I started to have that sort of perspective, oh, well, why would anyone be part of one religion? Why not, why not just with sort of an aloof perspective look at all the great religions, lots of cool stuff, and just sort of pick and choose? Why not? I thought that if you became one thing, that would be a narrowing or a reduction of what life is about. Take the big view of life, I thought. I kind of began to think that if anyone was one religion, it, it kind of looks cheesy and passe. I was very sophisticated, I thought. I started to have some experiences of Jesus Christ, and I didn't understand that. I didn't think I would be about delving deep into a religion. He drew me near to him. I didn't understand it. As I began to explore Christianity again more deeply, I realized if you go deep, it actually creates that wide view that you can have the magnanimous big view. If you go deep, standing aloof and aside is a superficiality. If you dive deep, then you see how everything connects. You can love all the religions, but you're deeper into your own faith. I decided to go to seminary. I didn't know I wanted to be a minister. I just was experiencing Christ and I wanted to explore that. I didn't know I was gonna be a professional minister at all. But the second year in seminary, you had to work at a church as an internship and I worked at First Congregational Church Berkeley. It's right next to Cal's campus there. And I'd walk down, and I started working in that church. And I fell in love with church. I'd already fallen in love with Jesus. But then I actually fell in love with church. I started to see the shape of our togetherness. That if I wanted to create a community, like what would be the best way to gather? I would want it to be a place where ideas could be explored, intellectual, where there'd be classes and a life of the mind. I would want it to be a place where there's music all the time. And churches are like where grassroots music happens in America. 360,000 churches where we sing together and play instruments and crank Led Zeppelin and stuff like that. I would want music. I would want the life of the mind. I would want there to be justice work done and striving for the wider community, serving others, serving the poor. I would want that. I would want it to be sort of like a salon where you could have conversations about everything on your heart. I started looking at what church is. I would want a place that when you were really elderly, I mean like 95, you could still be a leader. You weren't discounted. You could still be a leader in this community. Or if you're seven years old, you're not discounted. You're as much part of this as anybody else. I fell in love. And I remembered religion isn't a bunch of abstractions. It's the shape of our togetherness. And so when I say the word religion, just don't think of all the ideas. Think of what we do together when we do religion. It's very beautiful. Now, whenever someone's identity is very wrapped up into something they're making a claim about, you should take it with some caution. I'm a minister. Did you expect me to tell you religion doesn't matter? <laughs> so, see for yourself. Each one of these three-part sermon series, I want to lift up something maybe you haven't thought of about why religion matters, just to animate your imagination. Today I want to tell you, why does religion matter? Because it helps move you from self-centeredness to reality-centeredness. Oh, I'm quoting one of the most famous philosophers of religion of the 20th century. He believed that what religion is doing is trying to move you from being self-centered 
to reality-centered. Uh, let me explain. John Hick thought that the individual personally and naturally experiences God. You don't need religion to experience God. You do that directly in an unmediated fashion. He thought that you look out upon reality and you sense there's a world. It's not completely chaos. You sense this. You see a world. And so you notice it has significance. This is his key word. You sense there is a significance to life. This is a direct apprehension of your own. You've created your sense of reality that it's a, an order, a world, and it has significance. That for him is the experience of the divine. You don't need religion for that. But then when we come together into a religion, the religion to his mind is a way of transformation. Religions call it salvation. He believes that religion is trying to transform you from this self-centeredness to what he calls reality-centeredness. Again, that apprehension of the divine, but then also a deep empathy for others. He believes you see reality more clearly through the lens of a religion. Oh, interesting. Our society is constantly teaching you to be more self-centered. It's just the way it works. We create a deep anxiety in every person in our culture. We create this anxiety that you better prove yourself. You better make your way. You've only got one shot at this, right, in life. You better be a success because you need to display your worth as a person. You need to carve it out and create it. So this becomes this deeply self-centered task. You imagine all of life is this project you're engaged in to somehow make your way and prove your worth. And our economy is perfectly structured to keep moving you deeper into a solipsism, a, an inwardness and self-involvement. You've only got so much time in life. You've only got so much time. A big chunk of that time you have to take to just maintain your body. You have to eat, you have to sleep, you have to groom and take care of yourself. That's a big chunk of your time. And then in our economy, it only works if you're willing then to sell another big chunk of your time as labor. So we take jobs. That's a big chunk of time. And if you're in work that isn't very meaningful, then you now have two major chunks of your life where time is not moving you to your best self. It can be very grueling, this alienated form of labor. And then you have a little bit of free time left over. There's not much time, but there's still time to change the road you're on. When can you explore things beyond the self? You have to succeed at work, you have to take care of your body but we can come into our faith here. You just took some time this morning to come here and to consider the higher things. John Hick believes this process begins to move you from being so embedded in self to a wider view of the way things really are, a deeper empathy. The nuclear put down in our society, this is nuclear when you call someone a narcissist. That, that's like, that's going nuclear. You know, a narcissist is all about them, right? Completely. And so a narcissist lacks empathy for others. Now, they have an inflated sense of self, but for a narcissist, it's very brittle. If you violate their inflated sense of self, they could go ballistic. The reason this is the nuclear put down is because, well, we're all sort of self centered. Where's the line? This is why this put-down works. Who would know whether you're a narcissist? We all are pretty self-involved. We all struggle to have empathy. And then we come together in the faith. And step by step, we're drawn out of ourselves. We see reality. It's not all about us. We develop a compassion. Oh, wouldn't it be perfect 
if there was a place where you could be urged to strive for your best, to be the best you can, but that same place tells you you don't have to earn God's love. That's been vouchsafed in Jesus Christ. Wouldn't this be the perfect combination to push and propel you to seek your best, but also tell you you're good enough? That, my friends, is religion. And it can transform you. In the spirit of Jesus Christ, amen.